Greetings to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. I bring you greetings here from Friendship Baptist Church on behalf of our pastor, Dr. Reginald E. Backus, our Sunday School Superintendent, and Sister Frederick Williams, all of the officers and members of this great church. We're just so blessed that you are joining us for our Sunday School Hour. Today is the lesson for Sunday, February 5th, 2023, and it's entitled Wisdom and Foolishness, taken from the first book of Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 18 through 31. Our key verses today is 1 Corinthians 1, verse 28 through 29, and it reads, And the base, these, and the, and the, and the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen, and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Amen. What an uh, exciting lesson we have in store for today. Uh, Paul wrote this letter to the church in Corinth in hopes of uh, encouraging them to not depend on the ways of the world and the wisdom of the world, but to depend on the power of Jesus Christ. And in a time such as this, when there are so many conflicting stories, when we don't know who to believe and what to believe, it's important that we just set our sights on God and block out the distractions of this world. And so we have an exciting lesson, not a terribly long lesson, but we encourage you to stick through it for the entirety. And I do believe that God will bless each and every one of us for it. For those of you all that have been joining us uh, throughout this pandemic, we have been sharing a general lesson overview on our Facebook and YouTube pages. But if you would like to uh, have a traditional classroom setting, we do have several classes that are meeting through conference call and Zoom. So you can give us a, a call, or send us an email. We'll be happy to help you find a class that can meet your needs. But of course, we praise God for your presence, for your support, and as always, for your prayers. Please make sure that you turn on the subscription for our channel and turn on notifications so that you can get all of our content, our Wednesday evening Bible class taught by our pastor, Dr. Backus, and then our Sunday morning worship service where you'll hear some of the best preaching this side of heaven. If nothing else, we'll jump right into our lesson, begin with prayer, and we'll see what God has in store for us today. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all that's been said and done already. We thank you for all that you will do in our lives as we continue to grow in your word and your wisdom and your knowledge and in the power of Jesus Christ. Father, help us to understand that we have made mistakes and fallen short, but help us to celebrate that you give us brand new graces and brand new mercies each and every day. So look inside of us, whatever does not belong, replace it with your love, with your word, with your wisdom, and with faith so that we might see you clearer and better understand your will for our lives. Give me power, purpose, and permission to share with these your people and help us all to be better off because your words continues to speak to us day by day. Thank you for this church. Thank you for our pastor. Thank you for our superintendent. And thank you for each and every person that's uh, represented uh, on this lesson that we might be able to be strengthened according to your will. Now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. It is in your darling and precious son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we're hoping to, one, compare the wisdom of God with the foolishness of people, to, two, find joy in the wisdom that comes from being a follower of Jesus, and three, we will commit to using the strength and the wisdom of Jesus Christ in all that we do. So the church in Corinth uh, is, uh, started by Paul during his second missionary journey. There were some uh, uh, Roman Jews that were put out, and uh, Paul established this church and it was growing quickly. Now, the church in Corinth was one of the larger cities. It was a trade post and had a population of over 500,000, eventually over a million people. And this was one of the first large, like, diasporas of Christian community, meaning that they had believers from all over the place, different backgrounds, different heritages, different cultures, different ethnicities. And they were locked in the middle of the precipice, if you will, of Greek culture. And so... You had the Greek education, you had Greek philosophers, and then you had this collection of knowledge from the known civilization as the Greeks kind of occupied the known territory. They would take what they learned from the different uh, cultures, from the different uh, people, and they would bring it all back. And most of these things were happening in, the, in Corinth. And so Corinth was a bustling metropolis, and it had a growing Christian community. The issue was that the Christians sought to grow and expand through evangelism, but they began to water down their message so that they would not offend the philosophers, the thinkers, or people from other cultures. They wanted to try to blend, if you will, or water down, if you will, the gospel so that it would be more inclusive. Now, my brothers and sisters, one thing that I have come to learn in my life 
is that regardless of our comfortability, the word of God stands and stands strong uh, day by day. There are things that I continue to read in the Bible when I study, when I teach, when I pray, when I uh, when I'm just going through reading. I see things that are in direct contradiction to the way that I live and the way that I think. There have been times, even in the preparation of these Sunday school lessons, where God has not only uh, revealed what does not belong to my life, but really confronted me and put a conflict in my soul where I just had to understand that I was doing things that I knew God did not want me to do. And so we have options. I can either, for the sake of comfortability, ignore those things which I know I struggle with, or I can just kind of man up and accept the fact that God, I recognize and I praise God that you're revealing to me in my life what does not belong and through your power, not only will you continue to reveal it to me, but you will give me the power to overcome it and to turn away from it and to turn to God. And so that's what Paul is really doing in this letter to the church in Corinth. He's recognizing that they have kind of drifted off the path that they were on for the sake of inclusivity, and he's encouraging them to not give in to the ways of the world, to stand firm and to recognize that the ways of the Lord are contrary to the ways of the world and that we can't be on both sides of the fence. And perhaps many of us would be served better in our faith, in our churches, in our ministry, and throughout the world and the places that God has placed us to serve if we recognize there can be no compromise in the house of God. There can be no compromise in our faith. There can be no compromise in the way that we live. And there can be no compromise in specifically here our understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so our lesson is broken down into four different parts, not a terribly long lesson again, but I do believe that it will help us and encourage us to understand that the power of God supersedes the power of this world, and we should never depend on the foolishness of this world, but instead plant our feet in the foundation of Jesus Christ. So the first part of our lesson is entitled The Message of the Cross, Foolishness Versus Power, taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. The text reads, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So our lesson begins with Paul giving a strong and direct contrast to the meaning and the message of Jesus' work on the cross and his subsequent resurrection. Now, with only 50 to 60 years since the death of Jesus Christ at the time that Paul penned this letter, uh, the stories and the interpretations of Jesus' ministry, death, and resurrection have been the talk of the known civilization. Due to the rapid growth and the spread of Christianity, especially beyond the Jewish community, there were very few people that had not heard some version of Jesus' story. In addition, Jesus' promise that he would one day return and come back brought about false prophets and fake messiahs, both uh, serving to strengthen the lore surrounding the, uh, uh, the Son of God, but also watering down the gospel message. For the Jewish community, there was hope that Jesus would soon return and complete what had not been done during his first time on earth, to overthrow the occupation of the Greeks and restore Israel as a nation high above the others. For the non-Jewish believers, there was a hope that Jesus would bring an end to the tyry, tyranny, the famine, the disease, the taxes, and the poverty. And in the midst of all of this, there was an absence of spiritual foundation and many congregations, like the church in Corinth, they fell victim to false teachings and spiritual misunderstandings. Perhaps nothing was more controversial during the time than the facts surrounding Jesus' death and his resurrection. Questions like, was Jesus really a man? Did he really die? Did he really rise from the grave? And when he rose, was he in fact a person or was he just a spirit? All of these questions called division and misunderstanding and misinformation and uncertainty in the early church. And as a result, many congregations veered off the path that God had placed them on, and they began to water down their faith and practice or teach a gospel that was contrary to the word of God and the example of Jesus Christ. Here we find the church in Corinth, which was a strong and fast-growing congregation in one of the largest and fastest-growing cities in the known world. Surrounding this church were scholars and learned men, philosophers, who had long depended on the collected knowledge of the Greeks and Romans as the foundation of their knowledge and of their living and of their understanding. The world was growing faster than ever, and this newfound knowledge empowered men to believe that they had figured it out, and society began to take advantage of the pleasures and the freedoms that life offered. As a result of the culture of the time during our texts, 
immorality and, uh, swept through the land and it infiltrated the church. The church in Corinth no longer looked like a body of believers, but you could not tell the difference between them and non-believers because they had come to know or learn through a misunderstanding in their faith that they can live however they wanted to live as long as they believed in Jesus Christ as their savior. Scholars and educators not only dismissed the story of Jesus Christ or watered it down, but they looked at it as a fable and nonsense used only to provide hope to the hopeless. Unfortunately, when we are uneducated in our faith, it leaves us vulnerable to the vipers of this world and the enemy get, begins to pick holes in our understanding, usually attacking our beliefs through the logic and the understanding of this world. I share all the time one of the first times that I was led astray in my faith. Uh, I began to go to Sunday school pretty heavily and study the word of God, I believe at the age of seven. My parents made sure that my sister and I went to church every Sunday. They immediately placed us in youth groups and I started to grow in Christ to the point that I began to share my faith with others even at an early age in elementary school. Two of my closest friends in elementary school were not believers, they were Muslims. And as they saw me begin to share my faith, I guess they decided that they would share their faith with me. Uh, one day in school, they brought me a Bible, and in the Old Testament, they showed me uh, where God said that we should not eat pork. They asked me if I was a Christian. I said yes. They asked me if I believed the Bible. I said yes, and then they showed me where God said that I could not eat pork. Because it was in the Bible, and because I did not have an understanding of Old Testament law, versus New Testament freedom that we have in Jesus Christ, I thought that all my Christian friends were bad Christians because they ate pork, and I declared that day I would not eat pork anymore, not for health reasons, but for a misunderstanding of my faith. For almost two years, I refused to eat my mama's cooking. I missed out on pizza parties because I thought I was being a good Christian. It wasn't until I matured in my faith and had a better understanding of Old Testament law that I realized that I had been led astray. Me thinking that I was doing my job as a Christian, following the word of Christ, put me in a position where I was practicing a faith outside of God's will for my life. And I quickly understood that if we are not educated in what we believe and why we believe, that we can easily be led astray. And this is what was happening in the church of Corinth. They understood what God had called them to be. They understood what God had called them to do. Yet because they were uh, uneducated in their faith, because their foundation was not solid, they began to be led astray by the philosophers, the Greeks and the Romans, and they began to live a life that was contrary to God's will, thinking that they could play both sides of the fence. Uh, when, when Christians view, what Christians view as the power of the cross, the world sees as foolishness. How can a man die, get out the grave with the wounds of his death still visible, defeat death, and then ascend to heaven only to promise to one day return? The very premise of our belief seems exaggerated to the world, but it stands as the foundation of our faith. The world teaches that we can master or control our thoughts through worldly wisdom, through understanding, through logic. We are taught to believe that we can create boundaries or rules and use our own strength to empower ourselves and overcome the challenges of this life. However, as Christians, we have come to trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior because we recognize that we are powerless and unable to stand victorious over this world, over sin, without the power of Jesus Christ in our life. Therefore, our faith is an acknowledgement of our own inadequacies, our own weakness, and it's a reliance or, or dependence, rather, on the power of God to not only give us victory over sin and its effects, but also to grant us eternal life. This total dependence on the sufficiency of God through the power of Jesus' work on the cross stands in direct contrast to the world's view that we are to depend on our own abilities and our own strength for power in our lives. Even while on the cross, Jesus, who had all power in his hands, did not condemn or defend, but instead he offered forgiveness to the very people that persecuted uh, him and turned their backs on him while he lay on the cross being crucified. This act of love in the midst of the most awful of situations again stands in direct opposition to the ways of this world. But Paul makes it clear in the first part of this lesson that the ways of this world and the ways of the believer are diametrically opposed. And he lays the groundwork for his argument that there is no room for worldly understanding, wisdom, or logic in the life of a believer. Simply put, 
the work of Jesus on the cross is foolishness to the world, but power to the believer. And in contrast, the power of this world is foolishness to the believer because we know that it is both insufficient and ineffective, especially towards the ultimate goal of eternal life. Paul uses this 18th verse in the first book of Corinthians, the first chapter of the first book of Corinthians, to not only separate believer from non-believer, but he also identifies the very thing that this division is based upon, that those that believe in the power of God and those that believe in the power of this world. And just to be clear, you cannot have both. You cannot be on both sides of the fence. You either believe in the power of God or you believe in the power of the world. And as believers, we know that we've already made up our mind which side of the fence we stand on. So first we start this lesson in verse 18 with the message of the cross, foolishness versus power. Now we jump down to verses 19 through 21 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we see the results of God's wisdom. The text reads, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. So in these next three verses, Paul quoting the prophet Isaiah he then reminds believers that God despises and destroys the wisdom of this world. This dependence on one's own power and understanding was unfortunately not new in the body of Christ. Even in the Old Testament, leaders, prophets, kings, and judges often disregarded the word and the warnings and the will of God and took it upon themselves to maneuver or strategize each time leading to their own destruction or the ruin of Israel. Rather, it was forging alliances with rival nations, taking credit for the work of God, not following the instructions for moving the ark, or simply forgetting about the many blessings and miracles of God while allowing the worship of false gods, Israel had time and time again shown the proclivity for ignoring God's power and depending on her own power. In a rhetorical way, Paul asked his listeners to look back on those that were considered wise and educated throughout history and look at their fates. While temporarily thriving, each one has proven to be insufficient and lack the power to save themselves or anyone else for that matter. The wisdom and knowledge of this world has proven to be insufficient throughout the history of Israel, and Paul now warns against making the same mistake that Old Testament Jews had made so many times before. Paul makes it clear that the wisdom of this world will always be destroyed, but, y'all, but God uses the gift here stated as the foolishness of preaching as the vehicle by which his presence and power is revealed to his children. We may never understand how God uses flawed men to deliver the message of truth, deliverance, forgiveness, and salvation, but even the best and most morally righteous of our uh, preacher is not worthy to carry the gospel message. However, in spite of our shortcomings, in spite of our weaknesses, God empowers us to deliver his message of life to a dying world and usher lost souls out of darkness and into the marvelous light. Like Moses, a baby who was sentenced to death, who survived a crazy time on the Nile River, was a son in Pharaoh's home, found guilty of murder, went on the run as a fugitive from law for 40 years, only to return to Egypt and deliver the most memorable speech in the Old Testament all the time while suffering from a speech impediment, God can use the improbable to do the impossible. Like food falling from the sky during a time of wandering from the desert, like water from a rock, the ways of the Lord are beyond our comprehension and beyond the explanations and the understandings of this world. God uses the impossible to do what no one else can do, and he empowers we as believers to share the story and free people from the nonsense that this world offers. Again, we must understand that even in our own failures and shortcomings, God uses believers and the gifts that he has given us to be the tools of salvation and the lights in the midst of darkness playing a role in drawing the lost out and into the body of Christ. Uh, the The teacher's book, the commentary this week, points out that God uses the foolishness of preaching and not the preaching of foolishness. That means that the believer must understand, believe, and trust in the work of Christ on the cross and then depend on that faith and belief to empower our actions and our ministries. 
Therefore, our preaching, our teaching, our singing, all of our ministering is ineffective without both the power and permission of God. It's foolish on its own, but effective and life-changing when God ordained and God focused. So we look at the message of the cross, foolishness versus power in verses 18. We look at the results of God's wisdom in verses 19 through 21. But now we jump down to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 22 through 25, and we see the human response to the message of the cross. The text reads, 1 Corinthians 1, 22 through 25, for Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block to the Greeks' foolishness. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So Paul uses these next four verses, 1 Corinthians 4, excuse me, 1, 22 through 25, to identify the difficulty of man to accept the work of Jesus Christ. First, pointing out the hope of the Jews in reference to Christ's first coming, Paul identifies that Israel looked for proof in the form of power that Jesus was indeed the promised Messiah and the prophesied Messiah. Throughout the Old Testament, and especially during the intertestamental period, there were many men who appeared to be the Messiah. Uh, each of these men rose to power with the message of rebellion and opposition to the oppressors of Israel. There were three men uh, directly in the area of, of Jerusalem uh, during, uh, just prior to Jesus' birth that had started and led rebellions of the Jewish people against the Roman and, Greek and Roman uh, uh, occupants. And some of them had some type of victory, uh, gaining uh, fame and acclaim. However, they all, bought, all proved to be ineffective and not the promised Messiah. But Israel, because of their disobedience, had long suffered at the hands of their enemies, and they thought that their Messiah would come in the form of political and economic uh, empowerment. When Jesus came and gave his life in what the world views as a humiliating and demeaning way by being crucified on the cross, it was difficult for Israel to find hope and power in the work of Jesus Christ because it did not meet their own selfish expectations. Christ came to save the world from sin, but Israel hoped that Christ would empower them in the world of sin, or better stated, Christ to, came to save us from the world, while Israel hoped that Christ would empower them over the world. After identifying the issues with preaching to the Jews, Secondly, Paul points out the logic of the Greeks in reference to a dependence on the power of Jesus' work on the cross. So the Greeks were impressed and dependent on philosophical thought and educational dialogue. Christ did not have a deep philosophical message or provide some guru form of understanding. He merely offered his life as payment for the sins of the world. This was uncomfortable for the Greek because they could not find a deeper meaning or a higher plane of existence through the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. So Paul points out the difficulty in this message and recognizes the challenges of preaching a sacrificial uh, salvation to both Jews and Greeks. Perhaps the mistake of the church in Corinth was diluting the word of God to make both the Jew, uh, excuse me, the Jew and the Greek comfortable. The world in which we live often compromises morals for the sake of power and prestige. Even now in our political system, we see leaders compromise themselves to avoid bad publicity or to avoid stirring the pot or to avoid going against their own political party. However, as Christians, we must never compromise who we are and what we believe in hopes that we can hold on to some type of imaginary power that we never have in the first place. Paul warns the church in Corinth to not allow the demands of the world, uh, the demands of the world to influence their faith uh, or how they practice their faith or how they preach their faith. Paul concludes this third part of our lesson by saying that the weakness of God is mightier than the power of the world, and the foolishness of God is mightier than the wisdom of this world. Simply put, even at our best, we are no match for God. So we looked at the message of the cross, foolishness versus power in verse 18. We looked at the results of God's wisdom in verses 19 through 21. And we looked at the human response to the message of the cross, verses 22 through 25. But now we conclude our lesson with the reason for God's wisdom. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 31 reads, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. 
But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom for God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That, as it is written, he who glorifies, let him glorify in the Lord. Paul concludes our lesson in verse 6 by showing the church in Corinth that we are longing, that they are longing to be the very thing that God has freed them from. Through self-examination, Paul encourages his listeners to look around and recognize that God has called the poor, the downtrodden, the castaways into his body of believers. The early church was filled with slaves, widows, poor and hungry, and God looked past the standards of the world and welcomes all that believes in him into the body of Christ. These are the very people that the wise men of the world would look down upon and treat poorly. Why would you long to be like those that despise you when God has already given you more than they could already provide? It's the foolishness of this world that makes no sense. It's why David, as a young shepherd boy with just a slingshot, can defeat a giant named Goliath, who was a, a, a master of war. It's why God can give Israel victory after victory against insurmountable odds, simply because he favored them above all others. It's why, as we look back over in our lives, all the times we did not know how we were going to make it, how we were going to overcome, how we were going to survive, God provided ways out of no way. He opened up doors that we didn't even know exist. We serve a God that can do the impossible, beyond what makes sense, beyond what we can explain, beyond what is logical. And therefore, we should not depend on the wisdom and knowledge of this world as the foundation of our faith or understanding. Simply put, God's way is above and surpasses the ways of this world. And as Christians, we are taught to believe and depend and have faith in God and nothing else. Amen. What a wonderful lesson. I praise God for your time. I praise God for your time, for your presence, for your support, and always for your prayers. We thank you for studying with us and joining us for our Sunday school lesson. It looked as if we had a few interruptions with our internet connection, and so if you were disconnected or we phased out, we apologize, and we'll do our best to uh, uh, shore up any type of mistakes that we might have. But again, we thank you for supporting us and for joining us for our lesson. Uh, for those of you all that have joined us and worship with us in our study, we also encourage you to worship with us in our giving here at Friendship. We have four ways for you to support the work that we do here. You can give on our website, www.fbcchicago.org. You can text the word GIVE to 773-992-1462. You can give on Cash App, dollar sign Friendship Chicago. Or as always, you can mail your check or money order to the church, Friendship Baptist Church, care of Dr. Reginald E. Backus, 5200 West Jackson Boulevard, Chicago, Illinois, 60644. As always, we praise God for you. We thank you for joining us, and it's our prayer that something has been said or done that will strengthen your walk in Christ. And if you have yet to give your life in Christ, all we can do is continue to show you the light in the midst of darkness and pray that God will bring you to a, a place of understanding. It's our prayer that everyone that has uh, joined us on this call have a wonderful week, that God continue to bless you and keep you, and that we remember uh, the foundation of our faith, that even though it may not make sense to the world, we understand that we have hope in the hopeless of situations, that we have faith when the world tells us not to do, and we know that nothing is beyond the power of, of God. So on behalf of our pastor, Dr. Reginald Backus, our Sunday school superintendent, Sister Frederick Williams, we thank you for joining us, and we praise God for each and every one of you, and it is our prayer that you will have an amazing and God-filled week, and prayerfully you will consider joining us at 11 a.m., for our live worship experience where you'll hear from our own pastor, Dr. Reginald E. Backus. If nothing else, let's dismiss in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for another opportunity to study your word. Father, we thank you for all that you continue to do in our lives. We thank you that you continue to make your presence known by providing for us, by protecting us, and by giving us even the things that we don't deserve. Father, we thank you for this place called friendship. We thank you for our pastor. We thank you for our superintendent. We thank you for every Sunday school instructor and student throughout all of Christianity. We ask that you empower us, strengthen us according to your will and for your purpose, that we might be lights in the midst of darkness, that others might see our good works, but glorify you who is in heaven, that they might come running 
asking us what must they do to be saved, and we'll be careful to give you the glory and honor in all that we say, all that we do, and all that we are. It is in your darling son, Jesus Christ's name, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Please have an amazing, amazing week, and may God continue to bless each and every one of you.